For right now, maybe you've kept up with the news, maybe you've seen it on the news, maybe you haven't seen it. But right now in China, there is intense persecution against the Christian church. I don't know if you've seen that. Uh, one, one Christian says that there is absolutely no freedom at all. Um, the Washington Times says that right now, Christian persecution in China is the highest that it has been since Mao. There have been 7,000 crosses destroyed. Bibles are being burned. Churches are being closed. Christians are being forced to denounce their faith. There is this huge crackdown in China on Christianity. Uh, that's sort of foreign to us. We, um, we live in America. If there's ever been a Christian nation, America is it. We've lived in a nation where we have enjoyed a privileged position in society and in culture. And we have faced little, if any, formal persecution for our faith. But did you know that that is not the case in most of the world? In the past decade, over 900,000 Christians have been killed in various parts of the world. Our pastor training mission, which we're sponsoring in a very, very difficult country, uh, pastors there are regularly killed. Uh, churches there are assaulted. The churches can't even gather without armed guards, civilian guards placed at the door. So, you know, we, even where, we, where we're reaching, uh, even our friends who meet with us in our building, uh, Zomi uh, Baptist Mission Church, um, that particular people group are here for one reason in the States, because of religious persecution. We don't have to go very far from Briggs Road Baptist Church to see the effects of Christian persecution. And that brings us to the final beatitude in our series. I want you to read with me in Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the eighth and final beatitude that Jesus gives to his disciples. And I want, there's, there, this one is unique. It's the last beatitude. Uh, but, of course, it's the longest beatitude. And Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Now, I said this. Now, we, as believers in America, have not experienced persecution in the sense that many of our brothers and sisters in the world or in church history have experienced. However, if you live consistently the Christian life, and all of its implications, you will, even in our great nation, experience persecution. It may not be organized. It may not be governmental. It may merely be social. But you will experience opposition if you consistently live out the Christian life. I want you to notice these Beatitudes. We have a tendency to read them uh, atomistically, that is, separately. But I want you to notice something. What is the promise that Jesus gives to the persecuted? He says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Where have we seen that before? The last beatitude has the same promise as the first beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is showing us something here. He's bracketing those beatitudes, and he's showing us that these people, these blessed people, are all the same people. It's not like you've got some poor in spirit people over here, and some mourners over here, and some persecuted people over here. Some scholars have even seen a progression among the Beatitudes, that those who are poor in spirit will thus mourn, and those who are mourn will be meek, and so on and so forth. But I do believe this, that every one of these Beatitudes culminate with the idea of persecution. If you live these Beatitudes out, you are going to be the opposite of the world's values and the world's system, and you're going to face persecution. Jesus is talking about the result and the sum total 
of the Christian life lived consistently. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. But I also want you to notice here, this beatitude comes with an explanation. All the others are just flat. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. We move on to the next. But notice this, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But then in verse 11 comes this explanation of what that means. But I want you to notice something else in verse 11. There is a shift. Do you see the shift? Every one of the Beatitudes has been blessed are these people. Third person. Blessed are these people over here. Blessed are these people over here. Blessed are these people. These, whoever these people are, they're blessed. But verse 11 puts a point on it, and Jesus says, blessed are you. He's saying, you are the people I'm talking about. You who are listening to me, my disciples are the ones to whom these descriptions apply. It's sort of like on Scooby-Doo. When you get to the end of the mystery, and they say, well, who has this been all along? And they pull the mask off, and it's been, oh, Mr. the whoever, the butler or the gardener. You find out who it's been. Jesus has been talking about these people, these, these marvelous people who live this life, who, who live this life in opposition to the world, and then he pulls the mask off and he says, these people are my followers. These people are you. But also I want you to notice something else in verse 11, and we'll get to this in a moment. Notice these Beatitudes, they're not commands. They're descriptions. These Beatitudes are not commands. You go out here and mourn. You go out here and be meek, and then I'm going to do this for you. They're merely observations. Jesus doesn't talk about how these people came to be this way necessarily. He just says, you see these people? They're in this state. This is the way they live. This is what's true about them. The application of the Beatitudes and the command of the Beatitudes is found in verse 11, pardon me, in verse 12, when he says, rejoice and be glad. You see, these people who are blessed, I've tried to illustrate this as we've gone through, are people who are born again. They're people that something has happened to them to change their nature. Because you know what? Our human nature is not poor in spirit. Our human nature is pride. Our human nature is not to be merciful. Our human nature is to get retribution. Our human nature is not pure in heart. Our human nature loves sin. These are people who are otherworldly. These are people who are distinct and Jesus says they're blessed. And he says, if you are these people. Notice this. These Beatitudes, they don't describe things that we want, really. Who wants to be poor in spirit? Who wants to mourn? All right, we're going to have a meekness meeting right after church. And I want to see who wants to be there. If I got a, a well-known speaker or expert in here, uh, you know, someone who's prevalent in leadership, somebody like John Maxwell or maybe a successful business person, and I said, they're going to come in and they're going to teach principles, entrepreneurship, and leadership. And we publicized it. Man, we get a lot of people that would want to come and hear about maybe how to prosper in this world and maybe how to develop their leadership skills. But if I just got a local pastor, or maybe if I got a missionary to come in and hold a conference on how to be persecuted or how to mourn how to be humble I have a feeling we'd have a different response because these Beatitudes don't describe how we are naturally and they generally don't describe how we are prone to living but Jesus says these are the blessed people you don't look at mourners and say, man, they've got it going on. You don't look at the humble and say, man, that's the, that's the added. Watch our movies. Our movies and our heroes in our movies, they're not humble people. They're proud. They've got it together. They're in control. Alpha males. Alpha females, I guess, too. It's, 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 that's not the picture. But Jesus says these attributes, which the world does not value, which the carnal mind does not value, he says those are the ways to live in the world. And he says that those are the ways you're living. And if you're experiencing persecution, if you find yourself in the underbelly of society, he says, here's what you do with that. Do you fuss about it? Do you gripe about it? Do you complain? He says, no, rejoice about it and be glad. That is not what we expect. So I want to look this morning and see what Jesus 
wants us to do with this and what we should expect from this. So the first thing I want you to notice is simply this. Those who follow Jesus will be persecuted. Those who follow Jesus will be persecuted. This contrast was felt a lot more in the early church than it is for us. There were people who would be persecuted for their faith. Many times people who would be believers and it would come time for them to be baptized, the church would explain to them, you know, baptism was public. It was a public declaration of Christianity. It was your, sort of your coming out as a Christian. And they would explain this is going to bring to you persecution. This is going to bring to you marginalization. There are places in the world today that maybe not necessarily just violent killing sort of persecution, but if you become a Christian in a predominantly Muslim country, at the very least, um, when if you run a business, people are just going to shy away. They're going to go over here. Um, you know, you're going to be sort of be ostracized. Jesus says, I come to send a sword. I come to set uh, brother against brother. I come to set people against each other in their own families. You might say, why would Jesus do that? Well, it's very simple. You've got this nice Jewish family that have been observing the Old Testament and the law and observing the Torah and all of these things, and they believe in the 39 books of the Old Testament. Then all of a sudden, one of these nice Jewish boys or girls comes home and tells mom and dad, uh, this Messiah uh, that's just come, that says he's the Son of God, uh, I believe him, and I'm his disciple now. You see, most of the Jewish people, Jesus came to his own, his own received him not. Most of the Jewish people did not recognize Jesus as Messiah, but they thought he was a false prophet. I mean, just think all of a sudden, if I came in here and said, you know what, I'm the Son of God, and you need to worship me. Well, I mean, that would be false, of course, but it's the same sort of response that many Jewish people had. They'd say, this is blasphemy. There is one God, and only one God, and he's to be worshipped. And they'd ostracize their family members who came to Christ. They'd be cut out. They'd be persecuted. This is what Jesus comes to do. Even today. Even today, you know, we, we want this Jesus makes your life better gospel. And I'll say this, in the grand scheme of things, he does make your life better. He gives you a blessed life. But he's just described what that looks like. Better in the kingdom of God doesn't look like better in the world. Better in the kingdom of God looks like the poor in spirit. Looks like the mourning life. Looks like the merciful life. It looks like the meek life. But we want to build this picture that Jesus is going to make you healthy, wealthy, and happy and all of these sorts of things according to the world. Even today, if someone... I mean, think about it. Someone who their family has not been a Christian. Their parents are not Christians. Their grandparents weren't Christians. Their great-grandparents weren't Christians. None of their siblings are Christians. And all of a sudden, they become a Christian. Now, number one, they've got a lot to mourn about immediately because they realize that their deceased family members who weren't Christians are in hell. Number two, they realize that their life has been utterly redefined in a way that their living family members cannot share. And they realize that this is going to bring lifestyle changes that's probably going to cause friction. That is persecution. It's maybe not outright intentional persecution, but it's that same sort of idea that if you live this way, you're going to, you're going to have opposition. It's going to be hard. And people may not be trying to get you, but you're going to be facing this opposition, this sort of pressure, and you're going to have to live in spite of that. The very next phrase that we're going to look at next week, Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall it be restored? The salt and light, the light of the world, the salt of the earth, that's directly related to the Beatitudes. Because how do you become salty? You live this way. You see, salt doesn't affect things by being like the things it affects. Now, salt was used for preservation in the ancient world, but just think of it the way we use it, to season our food. You don't put salt on your food so your food tastes the same. You put salt on your food for one reason, because salt is different than the food you're eating, and it adds some savor to it. If the salt, if you put salt on your baked potato, but the salt tasted like baked potato, there'd be no point in putting it on there. The same thing is true about the Christian life. If the Christian life is just in agreement with everything the world is doing, then the Christian life is pointless. It doesn't do anything. 
The very thing that gives the Christian life its effectiveness and its beauty is its distinctiveness and its otherness from the world. But that's the same thing that also draws the ire, the persecution, and the opposition from the world. It's part and parcel. It just comes together. Those who follow Jesus will be persecuted. And Jesus expands on this. He says, number one, you're going to be persecuted. He says, blessed are the persecuted. But then verse 11, he says, blessed are you. And he expands on that. When others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. So there's, there's reviling. That's sort of the idea of slandering. There's persecution, which can be anything. It can be marginalization all the way up to being killed for your faith. And then he says, just uttering all sorts of evil things against you, lies or slander or misrepresentation or caricatures. We see that in our world today. If in our cultural climate now, if you're a Christian and you say, well, God has created, you know, it, it's kind of, it, it's amazing how distinct Christianity is becoming. If you simply say that I believe that babies are born either a boy or a girl, in our cultural climate, all of a sudden, that's a radical gospel statement nowadays. It shouldn't be. You know? That shouldn't be radical, but it is. And it's a way of culture just encroaching around Christianity. Now, it does two things. It makes it harder to be a Christian, and it cuts out a lot of marginal Christians. Our churches aren't as full as they used to be, but I think they're more pure than they used to be. But secondarily, it makes us more distinct. When you go to buy a piece of jewelry at the jewelry store, uh, you know, it's, it's not just cast in here on any old background. They, they sometimes they put it on a, a black felt so that, that diamond shines. And so as the darkness gets darker around us, we're becoming more distinct, or at least we should be becoming more distinct. That brings hardship, but it also brings effectiveness. So they're going to misrepresent you. So if you're a Christian today and you say, you know what, I believe that there are two genders, and that gender and sex are the same thing, and that God creates man and he creates woman, and he has created marriage to be the holy union between a man and a woman until death do them part, you are bigoted, you are hateful, you are homophobic, you hate other people, and you're intolerant. You're xenophobic. All of these strange words that are, that are applied to us simply because we believe not only what the Bible says, but what is self-evident in biology. And so they say all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Now, you might say, now, Pastor, I'm not sure that everybody is going to experience persecution. I, you know, I come from a Christian home, I come from a Christian family, and I'm around Christian people, and I just, I don't think I'm going to do that. Well, Paul says in 2 Timothy 3.12, he gives us a guarantee. He says, all who desire, everyone who aspires and desires to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Everyone. Everyone. 1 Peter 3, Peter says that um, if you suffer for Christ's sake, you are blessed for it. He kind of imitates the words of this beatitude, doesn't he? If you suffer for Christ's sake, you're blessed for it. He goes so far as to say, if you, he says, don't let any man suffer as an evildoer. He says, but if any man suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but glorify God. Now, Peter says there's two types of suffering. Notice what Jesus says here. He doesn't say blessed are the persecuted, that's it. He doesn't say blessed are the reviled, that's it. There's a qualifier, and what does it say? Well, it, it appears twice. Number one, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. And then secondarily, blessed are those who are persecuted for my sake. You can be persecuted rightfully. You can be opposed rightfully. He doesn't say blessed are those who are persecuted because they're obnoxious. He said blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. You see, you could suffer as an evildoer. You know, you could be in prison and you could be prosecuted and put in jail and suffer because of something that you did and you rightfully deserve the punishment that comes to you. 
He says, don't suffer because you're an evildoer. Don't suffer as a meddler. Don't suffer as a gossiper. Don't suffer as someone like that. He said, but suffer as a Christian. And see, this is where the fine line comes in. As a Christian, we want to live as peaceably and as honorably and as lovingly as we can. And if you suffer, you want to make sure that you're suffering for Christ, not for your own sin or failure or troublesomeness in this world. I know a lot of Christians. that They, they seem to judge their Christianity by how obnoxious they can be. There's a pastor... I won't give his name, but there's a, there's a pastor. that He's just a very caustic individual. He's in the news all the time because of things he says that are very inflammatory, things that he says that are unnecessary. And he was even imprisoned one time, quite frankly, because he was wrongfully opposing and rebelling against the police and God-established authority, just trying to be sensationalistic. That man is persecuted, and he deserves every ounce of it because he's being obnoxious. And he's making Christ to seem obnoxious to the world. Let's not suffer that way. Let's suffer because of righteousness. Let's suffer because of holiness. Let's suffer because of Christ. John 15, Jesus says this, verse 18, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, notice this, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world... Therefore, the world hates you. This is the Christian life. You are called to go the opposite way. You are called to walk in opposition to this world. I'm not here to try to be a snake oil salesman and try to persuade you of something falsely and then come back later and say, oh, by the way, this is what you signed up for. I think sometimes our evangelism does that. We try to downplay all the negatives, and then when people become a Christian, we're like, well, now all this is going to happen. Folks, if you sign up to follow Jesus Christ, you're signing up for a life of opposition, for a life of persecution. You're signing up for a life of difficulty. You're signing up for a life of sanctification. You're signing up for a life that constantly struggles against the sin that dwells in your body. You're signing up for a life that, according to worldly standards, is not the way to go. But it is a blessed life. It is a glorious life. It is a holy life. It is a life that yields fruit. It is a life that yields eternal fruit. It is a life that is beautiful. God calls us to it. But I want you to notice something else. Notice the promise. Now, if you follow Jesus, you're going to be persecuted, but notice the promise. He says, the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are persecuted. For his sake. He says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Again, the same promise that applies to the poor in spirit. Folks, you can't be persecuted unless you're poor in spirit. You know, this idea, well, somebody comes against me, I'm just going to rise up and I'm going to avenge myself. Well, that's not poor in spirit. That's not the life we're called to. Blessed are those who are persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, what do we do with that? This is a biblical principle. First the cross, then the crown. First the suffering, then the glory. First the pain, then the reward. We know this. Everyone in you in this room knows this. Anything worthwhile comes on the other side of discipline and pain. On a smaller scale, if you've ever learned a new skill, what you've had to do is submit yourself to a lot of grueling time learning and practicing. One writer says that it takes 10,000 hours of practice to become masterful at anything you do. It's grueling. You see a musician that's uh, well, well versed and, and, and able, to, able to perform and instruct. That's somebody that spent a lot of hours, probably when they were tired and didn't feel like it, sitting at a piano or playing a guitar and working at it. Okay, same thing, fitness, health. Um, it comes on the other side of diet and exercise. First the suffering and then the reward. Now these are on very small scales. But the same thing applies to the Christian life. And the reward is commensurate to the suffering. You see, we suffer in small ways to earn a temporal reward, whether it be fitness or skill in something that we do or 
what, it, what have you. But Jesus says, if you suffer for me, you're going to reap an eternal reward, a glorious reward. He says, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Yours is the kingdom of heaven. It belongs to you. Now, the kingdom of heaven, if you read the Gospel of Matthew, it comes up a lot. And Jesus says this to repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, the idea when Jesus says that, the idea every time the kingdom of heaven is brought up, the kingdom of heaven is, is a future idea. It's, it's out there. You know, Jesus is going to come. He's going to set up his kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is, is not here in our minds. It's out there. It's future. It's heaven. But Jesus says this to repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now, here, here's where we live. We live on the cusp of eternity. And the gospel tells us this, that the kingdom of heaven has come near, and that changes the way that we live and the way we, re we respond. Because the kingdom of heaven, Jesus says, brings judgment to those who don't know me, those who don't repent. But it brings blessedness and it brings eternal life to those who repent and believe. For 2,000 years, humanity has been teetering on the edge of eternity. We've been living in the last day for 2,000 years. The apostles said it was the last days. People say all the time, well, I believe we're living in the last days. Duh, that's old news. You know, we want to be real sensationalistic. Everybody wants to have a prophecy or wants to set a date and all that nonsense. Just, just do what the Bible says. We've been living in the last days. We're last day people. Uh, don't get on board with all this sensationalistic stuff. Jesus is coming not because of four blood moons or some nonsense like that. He's coming because he said he's coming. You might say, well, I believe his coming is near. Well, that's obvious too. It's closer now than it's ever been. Well, of course it is. It's farther in time than it was. And so we get all caught up in, in all of this stuff when what we really need to be doing is living as people who are on the cusp of eternity, living as people who believe the kingdom is at hand, living as people, as John the Baptist said, when the axe is laid to the root of the tree. The idea here is this, is that either judgment or reward is right on the verge of becoming reality, and that demands that we respond to this truth. The kingdom of heaven is both now and its future. The kingdom of heaven brings judgment to those that don't believe, but it brings blessing and life and glory to those who are Jesus followers, the people who are blessed. These people are blessed not because of how they live now alone. You would never say that. The word blessed literally means happy or fortunate. The second beatitude literally says, happy are the sad. That makes no sense. You would never say happy are those who are persecuted if it wasn't for the last clause on each of those promises. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They will be comforted. They will inherit the earth. They will be satisfied. They will receive mercy. They shall see God. They shall be called sons of God. That is where blessedness occurs and where blessedness is true. We are blessed not because of what happens now. We're blessed because of what happens then. It's true of us now. But the kingdom of heaven is near, and it brings all of the attendant blessings, and we are to live as though that is true. Acts 14, 22. Paul and his companions were strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying this, that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. But I want you to know something else. The kingdom is not earned. None of these beatitudes say, if, then. None of these beatitudes are cause and effect. The beatitudes are completely out of grace. These people who live this way, they live that way because they've been changed by the Holy Spirit. And these promises are not cause and effect promises. Jesus does not say, if you do this, then this will be true. Now, I think that sort of follows from it, but that's not the point of giving these. It's not behavior modification. It's not legalism. Jesus says, these people are blessed because this is true about them. These people are blessed because this is true about them. Why is that important? The kingdom of heaven is not earned. It is given. It's a gift of grace. Every one of these promises, they're not earned by our power. They are given by grace. You get to heaven and you say, you know what? I was mournful, and I was meek, and I was persecuted. And look at all that I've earned. Well, you've ceased to be poor in spirit. Salvation is a gift of grace. Well, it's just like if you had a child. Let's illustrate this. If you had a child, and you told that child, 
if you'll mow the grass and, and help, help in the yard work here, then, then I'll give you $20, give you an allowance. Or if you will do this, you know, if you'll, you'll do these chores, you know, I know some parents, they'll have a checklist, and they'll have all these chores, maybe on the refrigerator and for all their kids, and if you do this one, you'll get this, maybe a dollar, and it's sort of a way of teaching principles of work and reward. You, and your child comes along and says, oh, look at what I've earned, and mom and dad, they owe this to me, and the child comes up to you and says, all right, give me what I owe again, and they're really obnoxious. You as a parent, you've got every right to say, you know what, go do it, and, uh, or I'm just going to whip you about it if you don't do it. You don't have to pay them, do you? You absolutely do not. That's how we relate to our Heavenly Father. He owes us nothing. He owes us nothing. We owe Him everything. He owes us nothing. And everything we receive is an absolute gift of grace. Jesus says, Luke 12, 32, he tells his disciples, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And 2 Timothy 2, 12 says, If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. I used this illustration when I preached on the first beatitude. You, you may remember it. That as Alexander the Great lay dying, the great conqueror and the great ruler of the earth in his day as he lay dying one of his generals knowing that there's no replacement for alexander the great says well who who then now that you're dying will have the kingdom and he responded i leave it to the strongest in other words i leave it to whoever can take it that's how we think about kingdoms if we were to think about who's going to run the kingdom or who's going to run the United States, we think about the strongest, the most capable, the one who can get it, especially in ancient worlds when territories were conquered by, uh, you know, by armies and things of that nature. We would never say the kingdom belongs to the meek. We'd never say that the earth is going to be inherited by the meek. We'd never say stuff like that. That's backwards. The kingdom of earth doesn't belong to the persecuted. It belongs to the persecutors. The kingdoms of earth belong to those who take prisoners of war. The kingdoms of earth belong to those who show no mercy to their adversary. The kingdoms of earth belong to those with hubris and with might. Those who are on the upper end of the scale. Jesus says the people who are the prisoners and the martyrs and the persecuted, the kingdom of heaven belongs to them if we suffer we will reign with him now i want you to notice finally this i want you to notice this beautiful promise and this beautiful command believers can rejoice in suffering because of god's promises god is true god is good god is faithful Romans 8, Paul says this. He lists all of these things that we suffer and all of these things that we go through. He says, I'm convinced none of these things is able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And he says, moreover, in all these things, we are what? More than conquerors. He doesn't say in spite of these things. He says in, in all these things. And he mentions sufferings. He mentions persecution. He mentions death. He mentions all of these things that will oppose us and give us trouble. He says, in these things we are more than conquerors. In these things we are more than conquerors. There's an old story, an old fable. Um, talks about Brother Rabbit. Brother Fox, maybe you've heard it. And Brother Fox is always trying to catch Brother Rabbit. And he just... Never can. Brother Rabbit's too fast. He's too smart. He gets away. But one day, you might know the story, the, the fox, he makes, this, um, he makes this figure out of tar. And he knows that once that rabbit interacts with this tar baby, he's going to get it all over him, get it in his fur, and he's going to be just a mess. And that's what happens. Brother Rabbit, he gets all covered in tar, and he gets all bound up. 
Brother Fox gets him, and he's, he's got him. It's over. It's done. He's going to eat Brother Rabbit. Brother Rabbit says, you know what? He says, Brother Fox, he says, whatever you do, please don't throw me in the briars, in the thicket. Please, whatever you do, don't throw me in there with those sharp, needly briars to poke me and to pierce me. Have mercy on me, Brother Fox. Brother Fox says, you know what I'm going to do? He says, I'm going to throw him right in there. He throws him in. Now, if any of you all have ever been in nature at all, know anything about rabbits, or ever been rabbit hunting, you know where you got to get the rabbit out of? It's exactly where you got to get him out of. Brother Rabbit gets in there, and he wiggles around, and he rubs up against those briars and against that brush, and he gets that tar out of his fur, and he takes off, and he's a brother fox. He says, something that you didn't know, I was raised, and I was born in a briar thicket, and off he's gone. The very place that you wouldn't want to be, and the very place that I wouldn't want to be, the rabbit was right at home. And it was actually advantageous to him. And what would have looked like bad news was actually his salvation. Through many tribulations, through many briars, through many thickets, we must enter the kingdom of God. The things that look like they're killing you may be the things that are saving you. Think about all the people who maybe through tragedy or through some adverse circumstance came to know Christ. You may be through in an adverse time right now. And it may be causing you to draw closer to Christ. Maybe you've had a sin problem in your life. And God has chastised you and he has guarded off your way and he has caused you to be wounded. Maybe so that you would consider your way and repent and turn from your sin. You see, we don't look at these things and say, blessed are those that this happens to when you look in the scales of eternity and you see the far greater weight of glory that suffering brings, well, then we can get it home in the briar patch. Acts 5, verse 40. The apostles in the early church, they've been preaching Jesus. Again, in this Jewish culture that had rejected Jesus, they had been beaten and told not to talk about Jesus anymore. Acts 5.40 When they had called the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. What did the disciples do? They go back home and say, oh, I can't believe it. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to write my senator. I'm going to send a letter. I'm going to call the governor. I'm going to get this taken care of. Now, they didn't have that sort of government that day. That doesn't mean that that's not a good thing to do sometimes. But they didn't say that. They didn't say, we're going to start a protest, we're going to start a campaign. They didn't go back and cuss and fuss and gripe. Because they remembered that Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted. They remembered that they're following a crucified Messiah. And that he said, if you follow me, the world's going to hate you. They went back and they rejoiced. Because they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. You know, there's the old cliched question. If they were charging people and jailing people for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Nobody wants to be jailed. Nobody wants to go to prison. But if, if that's the mark of a Christian, then let's go to jail. Let's go to jail. There's a legend about the Apostle Peter, and it very well may be true. Perhaps you've heard it, that Peter was crucified upside down because he said that he wasn't worthy to be crucified in the same manner as his Lord. The story goes like this, that Peter was at Rome, and he had heard that he was being sought out to be arrested and to be killed. So he began to flee as Anybody in their right mind would. Uh, you know, we don't necessarily just jump into persecution. Um, we take it when it comes. Peter's leaving the city. And, and the story goes, whether this happened or not, I don't know, but it's, it's a good illustration. 
that as he was leaving the city, that he saw Jesus. He saw maybe a vision of Jesus, and he said, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus responded, and he said, Peter, I'm, I'm going to Rome to be crucified. And Peter gathered from this that he was, it was his time. And so this legend goes that Peter ran back, and he requested to be crucified upside down because he was not worthy to be crucified the same way as his Lord. The idea there is that Peter realized that the cross isn't something to be avoided. Uh, the idea there is that Peter realized that the cross is our union with Christ. It's like the preacher I talked about last week that got so discouraged because everybody liked him. And he was going to quit the ministry because everybody liked him. Because he realized that that's not the mark of a Christian. But we can rejoice in suffering. We can say, Lord, we can rejoice. This is good. We are blessed because we are your people. Romans 8, 17 says that if we are children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. I want to point out one, the last thing in this text. Now, Jesus says, now here, you're going to rejoice. This is what you do. And he gives the grounding statement for why you rejoice. And, of course, we've already looked at that. Because your reward is great in heaven. All right? But that's not all he gives. He gives another grounding statement. He says, For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, wait a minute. For so they persecuted the prophets that were before you. What do we do with that? Jesus is saying this. He says that if you are persecuted, you're in good company. You see, Jesus is showing his people, his believers, that if you are persecuted, it's, it's not just that there's something strange going on. He says if you're persecuted, you're standing in the tradition of the people who followed me years ago. So for persecution, there is, number one, there is a past example that people who love God and follow Him have been persecuted. And then there is a present command. Right now, because of that, you're in good company. Rejoice. This is a mark that you belong to me. And then there is a future promise. So there is a past example, there's a present command, and there's a future promise. Jeremiah was persecuted. He went and he, he was persecuted by his own people. He was persecuted by people who said they believed in God. And he would preach to them to repent. They tried to kill him. They threw him in a pit. And eventually he was captured and taken as a prisoner of war, presumably to Egypt where he was killed. This isn't in the Bible, but it's a legend. And the book of Hebrews seems to bear it out as true. It may very well be. The book of Hebrews talks about people in the Old Testament who were sawn in two with a saw. That's in Hebrews 11. And the, 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 the Jewish tradition is that, that that was Isaiah. That that's how he died. The fact of the matter is, Jesus says, you're going to be persecuted by Jewish people because you're not going to seem Jewish anymore because you believe in me. He said, but as a matter of fact, he said, the most faithful in the Old Testament were those who were persecuted. And he says, and if you're persecuted, you're just showing that you're following the same God they were following. Now, what do we do with that? As believers today, rejoice if you're persecuted. Why? Because the Old Testament prophets that followed God were persecuted. Because Jesus himself was rejected, crucified. Because Jesus had 12 apostles, all but one of them died brutal deaths of martyrdom. Because the early church faced persecution. And as I mentioned, in the world today, in the past decade, nearly a million Christians have laid down their lives for the Lord Jesus. I don't like to suffer. I don't like it. It's not comfortable. But I pray that if the cost of being united with Jesus, if the price of being identified 
with our Lord is that I would lay down my life for him. I pray that God gives me the grace and gives me the fortitude and gives me the faith to walk through the cross and to walk through the briar patch to the glory that's on the other side. Jesus says, blessed are you when you're persecuted for my sake. For great is your reward in heaven. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it's true. Father, shape us, remake us, embolden us, Father, to follow you. Sometimes persecution can make us think, are we doing the right thing? But Lord, let us know that when we're following you, we're being opposed. God, that we're following the footsteps of our Messiah. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.